Welcome to the John Gets Games Impressions Vlog. Today I'll be discussing four new games that I was able to play recently, and I'll be going through them in alphabetical order. Now before we go into that, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Also, if you would like to directly support the channel and the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to johngetsgames.com support. There you'll find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and some of them come with cool perks like voting on a couple of the videos that I film each month. Alright, let's now start talking about games, and the first one is going to be Azul Summer Pavilion. Now, this came out at Spiel just last month, and it is the newest in the Azul line of games. It's the third one. Now, the first Azul came out, I believe, three years ago. Uh, the second one was Azul Stained Glass of Sintra, which came out last year. Now, each one of these three games uses the same uh, core conceit for getting tiles. Now, um, in all three of these games, you have these coasters in the middle of the table with uh, four uh, randomly placed tiles on them. And when it's your turn, you are going to select a coaster and then take all of a certain color tile from that coaster. Uh, those will get uh, put in front of you, and all of the other tiles will get pushed into the middle. Uh, from that point on, you can take all of a certain color from the middle of the uh, table, and the first person to do that in each one of these games is going to be the starting player for the next round, and they usually take some sort of penalty. Uh, now, that's the same for all three of these games, but at this point, things become somewhat different for Azul Summer Pavilion. Now, in Summer Pavilion, you are doing this drafting, but you're just putting the tiles that you take into a pile. You don't actually place them anywhere uh, at this point. So we are going to keep going around and around the table, drafting these dice and putting them into our pile, and then once we finish that, we will then go into a building phase, which which is uh, totally different than the previous two Azuls. Now, in this phase, each player is going to take a single action, and they're going to go clockwise around the table. Now, the way this works is you're going to select uh, some of your tiles, whether they be all of one type or uh, including a wild color, and there's a different wild color every round. And you will then take a single tile and place that down onto an open spot on your player board. Now, that spot will have a number. It might say three, and that means you have to spend three tiles to do that. So you spend three tiles, one of the three goes down onto your board, and the other two go into this big tower, which is essentially a tower discard uh, tile discard pile. Uh, now, as you put these down, you're going to score for them. And uh, with the scoring, you are just going to score one point for itself and then one point for every adjacent tile to it. Now, the way your player board is structured is you essentially have these seven wheels for these diamond-shaped tiles, and uh, one tile will never be adjacent to another one from a different one of these circles. So um, you are trying to build these out within these areas uh, to try and get adjacency going, because this is getting you points as you go. Obviously, the first tile is one point. Uh, the fourth tile uh, next to the other ones is going to be worth four points, and that's a lot better than one. But of course, you can also stagger around in uh, within that given circle. Now, you do also get bonuses, and this is really where the game gets quite interesting, because so far, uh, everything I've said is fine. It's pretty straightforward tile placement type stuff. But between each one of the uh, tile circles on your playing area, there are these other shapes. Uh, in the central area, there's a certain type. Then in the middle, there's another. And on the very outside, there is a third type. And whenever you surround the middle ones or put two adjacent to the last one on the outside, you get bonus tiles from a central display in the middle of the table. So this is the reason you have to go in player order with this construction. You can't go uh, just simultaneous. Because if I place a tile down that fully surrounds um, one of the middle tier bonuses, then suddenly I can take two new tiles from the center and put it into my supply that I can then use to construct this round. So you might take tiles that are good to get the next tile placement out, and you also might be taking tiles away that other people are hoping to get as well. So now you're considering what other people want, but mostly what you want. And then once those tiles go away, some more random ones come out. So this uh, part of the game is uh, quite thinky, honestly. Uh, there's a lot to consider, especially considering, again, every single round there is one type of tile that is wild. Now, I didn't mention this before, but when you are taking tiles in the beginning of the game, or in the beginning of the round, uh, you're never allowed to just take the wild tile. You can take other ones and then grab up to one wild from that specific spot. So that's a good way to kind of push around uh, what the wilds are going to be. Uh, but also, you know exactly what the wild is this turn, and next turn, and every single turn for the game, because it's always the same set. So there is extra levels of thinking coming into play with the tile drafting, where maybe you take a bunch of ords this round because it's wild next round. Now, you're allowed to save up to four tiles between the rounds, so that might be a decent idea to really catapult you into a big scoring for that next round of the game. So, a big part of this game is all about trying to squeeze the points that you can out of the tile placement. You're trying to have the right number of tiles to be able to pay for the tile placement that you have. You're also trying to 
surround these bonuses to get more tiles, which will help you pay for placing more tiles. And you're trying to uh, make sure that you do not have more than four tiles at the end of your turn, because if that's the case, then you start losing points. Now, at the start of the game and in the middle of the game, that's no problem at all. But late game, it can be a bit tricky to try and uh, build these things in, because at that point, you've probably built all of the easy tiles out. Uh, now at this point, I think let's talk about how the game ends. You're just going to go through six rounds and then players are going to get bonus points at the end of the game for their completed, uh, fully completed circles. And also players will get points for having all of a, a the, all their ones covered, all their twos covered, all their threes covered. Um, and I think there was a couple other things that I can't think of at this right moment. Uh, so what this means is there's a lot of things to consider. You're trying to finish out these wheels. You're trying to cover up all of the low level stuff. You're trying to get adjacencies to get bonuses. And what this means is this is a very thinky game. Um, honestly, it was fun. Uh, I think all of us quite enjoyed it, but it's easily the slowest Azul game by far. Uh, we played a four-player game of this, and it was definitely over an hour and a half. Uh, the original Azul it usually comes in under an hour. Azul Stained Glass of Sintra, what, which was the second one, was a bit longer, but not that much. So this one, it just really slows down with the tile placement part of the game. And it's a fun part of the game. Like I enjoy the thinking and the strategizing and looking out to see what everybody else is doing. But there can be a decent amount of downtime as other people are also taking their time to take their turns. And it just takes a while, even so, just to process all of the placements as you go around and around and around the table. So I think that the game brings some pretty interesting stuff to the table. I think that four players is probably not worth it from a overall game length perspective. And I liked the stuff that I was doing, but I felt like um, while it did feel like a fresh take on Azul for sure, it um, was not necessarily worth the uh, amount of time that it took to actually play it. So um, I might end up having a chance to play this one again in the future. And if I do, I will likely avoid playing it at uh, the full player count because I think it would likely be uh, quicker with less players just because there's less people to take turns when you're in the tile placing phase of the game. Next up, we have game number two, and this one is Expedition to Newdale. Now, this is a new uh, big box game designed by Alexander Fisher. Uh, this just came out at Spiel. Uh, Maracaibo was another game that came out at Spiel, which is currently like my favorite game of the year, essentially. Uh, but anyway, um, Expedition to Newdale is effectively a board game version of a game that came out many years ago called Oh My Goods or Royal Goods, depending on which copy you got. Now, in Oh My Goods, that was a card game. It was a relatively small box, and it was all about using using these multi-use cards to try and build up a production chain. Like, um, you start with just coal, and then you get a thing that uses coal to make some uh, um, some bricks or some uh, better things. I can't remember the specific, but, you know, planks of wood, and then you find something else that uses planks of wood, and then you make some glass, and then you take your glass and your planks of wood, and you make a window, and you get a bunch of points for that. Like, that's what Oh My Goods was all about. Now, Expedition to Newdale takes those ideas and brings it into a fully-fledged board game idea. So I'm not going to go into the specifics of the old game uh, uh, because I don't think we should take all that time. Uh, but for uh, Expedition to Newdale, the way it works is you do start out with just a coal-making factory. And uh, there are a couple steps as you go through the various rounds in the game. And what you're deciding to do is uh, which one of your factories are you going to activate. You have the option of activating multiple if you're able to build more of them. And you have to decide how confident you are in that activation. Now, every single card that you have in front of you is going to tell you what it needs to to be activated. There's two ways to activate, and one way uses these uh, neutral kind of workers that come out in the game. Now, the way this works is you're going to reveal a set amount of them at the start of each round, and then you're going to make decisions. You're going to plan out what you're going to do. You're going to activate this coal uh, farm, or mine, <laughs> and you're going to send some workers out over there to get another worker, and, you know, maybe ditch some cards and whatnot. And then once everybody's fully planned, you then reveal more of those neutral colored workers. Only at that point, you actually get to run things. So that means there's a bit of push your luck here, because you're not sure exactly which of the colored workers are going to come out. So you might be kind of banking on there being one more blue to come out, or you might hedge your bets and run your factory uh, relatively inefficiently, which actually gives you discounts on the amount of workers that you need to activate it. Now, the way this works in uh, Royal Goods, or Oh My Goods, uh, was a little bit simpler, but it was a lot more streaky. But in Newdale, it seems a little bit more focused on this idea. Like, in Royal Goods, uh, you could potentially have, you know, 10 worker worth of stuff. But in this game, you're pretty much always going to know exactly how much more is going to come out. There's no uh, real uh, guesswork going on there. 
So uh, after you do that, you're going to run some stuff. You're going to turn your coal into planks of wood and, and whatnot. And you're going to also have the ability to discard cards from your hand to activate the buildings that you have in front of you. Now, you have to actually activate them in order to do this, but you don't have to use the workers to make this happen, which is a difference from royal goods. Um, but again, I think I'm talking about royal goods too much. <laughs> uh, so what this means is the cards that you have in your hand can be built out uh, by spending money to, as uh, new factories that you can activate, or you could discard them as a resource and the resource kind of shows up in the middle left hand side of the card so you have to weigh that back and forth and the way you track the resources is you just have these little brown cubes that you put down onto the factories now the way you pay for stuff is you discard the brown cubes and that card that you discarded it from tells you how much coin worth you got for that. Uh, so if you get rid of a single coal, which is the basic resource, you're just going to get one coin. But if you're getting rid of a loaf of bread, that single resource that might be worth five coins to you, but you had to get the wheat together, you had to make flour, you had to combine that stuff to actually make the bread happen. So it had a bit of a supply chain there. Now, when you build these buildings out in front of you, there's also a map in the middle of the board, which is totally new uh, to uh, this game versus the old one. Um, you're going to put these little house tokens out on this map as you kind of uh, go from left to right and you're going to get bonuses based off of different regions you go to. There are going to be extra little perks that you get. Everybody has a hidden goal that uh, is contingent on some of the banners and whatnot that are showing up on this board. And the farther you go out and the quicker you go out, the more points you will get because some of the locations will give victory points to the first person to go there. So that's the general... Uh, a gist of the game as you're going. And that's also um, all that I saw because I only played this game from the first scenario. So at this point, I should definitely mention that this game has a, uh, a set of scenarios. I think it might be eight or so. And you could decide to play any of them in any order of your choice, or you could play through them in order if you want a little bit of a, an emergent story. But depending on what scenario you're playing, there's going to be different cards that are shuffled into this event deck. Uh, there's also going to be different maps that you play with and whatnot. Now, uh, we actually played this one twice at Board Game Geek Con, and we actually did play through the first tutorial, very introductory scenario, and then the next one after that, which actually brought in characters and whatnot, but it was relatively similar in complexity. So we got to see a little bit of a change from one game to the next, and if I had a copy of this, I would certainly play it in order just to see how things evolved as uh, new things came in and new things came out. So uh, I liked that aspect to the game. I thought uh, that was pretty neat, but I couldn't help but feel like it was a bit overshadowed by the awesome story mechanic that Maracaibo has that Alexander Fisher also uh, published and had released at the same time. Uh, this uh, kind of campaign scenario type thing going on in New Dale I don't know, felt a bit dated to a certain extent. I mean, it's not exactly an old idea, but uh, sometimes it can be a bit hard to just jump into one of the more complicated ones if everybody isn't already familiar with the game. So uh, this is certainly one of those where I would be concerned that um, I might just keep playing like the first couple scenarios over and over again because I'm concerned about bringing in one of the bigger ones at the end. Or maybe the ones at the end are not more complicated, they're just different. So I, I don't know. If I had a copy of this one, I would certainly experiment a lot more with these. And I have to say that I think that uh, having Oh My Goods be turned into a full board game was a good decision. I think there, there were some cool streamlining things that happened overall by having um, the uh, the amount of stuff that you have to make stuff be less streaky uh, based off of the workers versus the suns that you just draw from a random pile. And it did seem like the supply chains were a little bit more muted in New Dale. Uh, in the original game, some of them were really quite long and intricate and hard to put together. But it would also not surprise me if the supply chains got more interesting and longer as you go deeper into the campaign because um, in the very first tutorial scenario you can make clay pits and they would do nothing it just clay was a resource you could spend for money but once we got into the second scenario spoiler alert um, you could use clay to make bricks <laughs> it's not really much of a, a spoiler but uh, even going from the first play to the second play we saw one of the supply production chains grow so I imagine there's going to be a lot more of that growth as you play through the overall scenarios of New Dale so I uh, liked New Dale quite a bit. The reason we played it a second time is because we enjoyed the first play so much. Um, but I don't think I'm enamored with it. Like, I would not mind playing it again at some point in the future. But I don't know how hard I would actually push to get it played. Uh, while I do think it streamlines some things and also embellishes on others from uh, Royal Goods, or Oh My Goods, um, 
To a certain extent, there's some of the simplicity that's kind of lost in just having a straight up card game that could be a bit random, but also a bit explosive and whatnot. Uh, this is a longer playing game than the original one was. So I think they both deserve a place in board gaming. And I do think that New Dale is uh, worth giving a try. Um, I might have a chance to try it again at some point in the future. And I certainly won't be against that. Uh, again, I just don't think I am super excited to keep playing it. I was relatively excited after the first play. And after playing it a second time, that excitement got muted a little bit, but um, I don't think that's necessarily the game's fault. We played a lot of games at Board Game Geek Con, and this one just got a little bit overshadowed by other games like Marco Polo 2, Maracaibo, and The Magnificent. All right, let's now move on to the third game I'll be discussing, and that one is Illusion. Now, this is a design that uh, was made by uh, Wolfgang Borsch, who is a bit of a, a surprise explosive star in the board game design field the last couple years. Uh, he designed Gonshin Clever, as well as um, Quacks of Quinlanburg, and many others that are not immediately coming to my brain. But um, in general, I've enjoyed a lot of the games that Wolfgang Borsch has made. Um, I also am not in general in love with any of his games. Like, I think he does really cool ideas, so I'm oftentimes interested to try them out. Now, Illusion is not new. Uh, I think it might have been a, a 2018 release, honestly, uh, and I've, I've heard about it a little bit, and it looked like this simple game, like a bit of a nothing burger, like why would I even pay attention to it? Because when I saw photos of people playing it, I just saw a card row with various abstract shapes on it, and I heard that the game was all about trying to ascertain, does this card have more yellow on it than that card? And that just sounded kind of, like, is that even a game to me? So I never really paid attention to it. But then I had the opportunity to play it uh, actually at the airport on the way to Board Game Geek Con, And I've actually played it again subsequently, even after that, because another friend has it. And I have to say right from the outset that this was actually a lot of fun. And I think it's very likely that we're going to pick up a copy of this one, maybe very soon uh, before the holidays. Um, now, the way the game works is uh, you are uh, on your turn. You're going to uh, draw the top card from the top of the deck if it's the start of the round. And if it's not the start of the round, then you have have a decision every turn. You either take the card from the top of the deck, which you can see, it's face up, and then you put it down into this row of other cards, and you have to put it into the spot where it belongs. So uh, within each round, there's going to be different colored arrows. Maybe you have a green arrow, and that means you're only looking at the green on this card. So that means you're saying, how much green is on this card uh, proportionally, like percentage-wise? And then you look at all the other cards in the middle of the table that are hypothetically in order from least green to most green, and you need to figure out where to put this new card in that's correct. Now, instead of doing that, you could just say, I think there is an error somewhere. And that means you flip over all the cards, and on the back, it shows you a percentage of how much of each color is in there. And if there are any errors, then you win the round, you take the arrow, the first person to three arrows wins. Now, let's say there was no error, then instead that arrow goes to the person who just took their turn, so they were the last person to add something in. So, um, that just adds a lovely little bit of tension there. Now, this game is brain bendy in how <laughs> really it makes you think about the, uh, the areas of what you're trying to do here, and honestly, from a rules perspective, I just taught you the whole game. Uh, th that's it. Uh, you just play until somebody has three arrows. That's it. And um, when we played this one, the first time we played it once and then rushed off to our planes. The second time we played it, we actually played it back to back twice because each game was like eight to 10 minutes long. So this is definitely a filler game considering it's so easy to teach and so quick to play. But it was fun. Like in all three of those plays, I really actively enjoyed the decisions I was making. It definitely had feelings of Liar's Dice and Skull, which are uh, also games where essentially you are doing some bluffing, uh, maybe some um, uh, some guesstimates with your bluffing, and if the person after you uh, calls your bluff, then maybe you will lose a thing and there's player elimination in both of those games. Now, I like that in Illusion, it's inverted. There is no player elimination. If the person to my left uh, calls my bluff then and they're right, then they get a point. I don't lose a point, so I'm still in the game, and I'm still bummed they got one of the three points they need to win, but it feels a little bit less impactful. Uh, also, there is this wonderful part of the game where as you're adding these things in and things are getting so close, um, there are oftentimes moments where you're looking out there, there's like five cards, and you think, one of them's got to be wrong, right? And you're not actually sure which one it is. And I like the fact that the game does not force you to say, this one is wrong, yes or no. It just says, you know, I think that there's enough cards, the odds are high enough that I think there's something that's going to be wrong. And you flip them over and uh, I've seen situations where there are ties, like 15%, 15%, and, you know, that causes one person to, they thought it was switched over and it was actually identical, which means it's actually correct. Uh, I've also seen cases where it goes 15%, 14%. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, that's so hard to parse. Uh, this game really leans on the, the fact that human brains are not great at uh, this 
uh, activity of trying to figure out exactly uh, proportionally how much of a thing is compared to another thing with all of these abstract shapes. And it's just fun. Uh, I want to play this game more. Um, I have, I will likely have the opportunity to play games with uh, some nieces and nephews over the holidays uh, that range from like 11 years old down to three years old. And I don't think a three-year-old would be able to uh, play this one, but um, certainly uh, the, the older ones, I think we could jump right in. I think like a six or seven-year-old would have zero problem with this. Honestly, I think a five-year-old would have no problem with this game at all. And um, this is probably one of those games where a five-year-old would be just as competitive as a 35-year-old because, you know, it's just leaning on the uh, the human uh, ability to make this processing happen. And perhaps kids would be even better. I have not played it with kids yet, but I do think there's a possibility of it. And uh, the more I'm talking about it, the more convinced I am that I'm going to shell out the 10 or so dollars or whatever it is to get a copy of this game because it was a bit of a gem. I, I love how quick it was to teach. Uh, I love the laughs that we had. I love the thinking. Um, honestly, after playing it twice, which took about 20 minutes, we were done because our brains just felt almost a little jelly, like you're really focusing so hard on it that you cannot play this for that, that long, but that also makes this a great filler style game. So yeah, a uh, big thumbs up for Illusion. Okay, we've reached the fourth and final game I'll be discussing today, and that one is Runestones. Now, this is a new design by, from Rudiger Dorn, who has made lots of games that I like, uh, like Karuba and um, Iquazu and several others. I'm really bad at just coming up with games on the fly when I'm recording. I should do research. Uh, but either way, uh, this is a new game that was published by Queen Games, and I've been quite interested in this one for a while, pretty much since I saw Rado's run-through of this game that came out a couple months ago. Now, this is a deck building style game with a really cool, weird idea. Now, every single turn of this game, you're going to take one of three different action options. Uh, the first option involves buying new cards from a card row. Now, the way this works is you look to your hand of cards and you will have a variety of little gems in the top left. And you have to discard all cards of the same color with the same color gem. You discard them into your own personal discard pile. The amount of little icons that showed up is going to dictate how many cards from this card row you can take. Those will come into your discard pile. Boom, that was your turn. You now have more cards in your overall deck that you're building. Now, the second thing that you can do is really uh, the reason I wanted to play this game because uh, instead of buying new cards, you can choose exactly two cards from your hand and you will activate both of them. They have actions in the middle left-hand portion of them. Uh, they usually involve getting gems of a variety of sorts or maybe spending gems to get other gems or wild gems. And then after you activate both, getting some nice abilities that feel good, you look in the, at the number in the top left corner of those cards. Now, every single card in this game has a unique number, and the higher number of those two cards that you played is going to be lost. You lose it. It's gone from your deck. So that means as you're deciding what actions you want to play, you want to try and protect really powerful things by getting even higher numbered things. And in general, the higher a number numbered card is, the more powerful it is. Now, each portion starts with an identical deck and they have the highest value cards in the game, which means as you play through the game in the early to mid stages, you're just going to be shedding the starting cards. You're just going to lose them uh, at a pretty quick pace because they're all in the hundreds. And then once they're all gone, then you're just playing the cards that you have. And so this game is a deck builder where you're adding cards in and you're pulling them back out again at a pretty furious rate, all to get these gems, which fuel the third and last option you can do on your turn, which involves grabbing artifacts. Now, these artifacts are listed on the bottom part of the board and you have to spend certain numbers of gems to get them. And then once you take them, you put them onto these little power rows on your player board. And once you have at least two, I think it was, you can actually discard them to pick up a runestone, which is obviously the name of the game. You also get points for this, and the more uh, that you have that you wait before cashing in, the more points you get and the more points per artifact that you get, but you always get one runestone. And there are I think six or seven uh, runestone types in the game. And when you do this, you take one, you slot it into your player board, and you now get an ongoing power for the rest of the game. For instance, the first one that I took gave me a free uh, wild two extra buying power every time I bought stuff. That seemed like a pretty good first pick. Uh, another one lets you increase your hand size, and another very volatile one that I played extensively lets you, uh, instead of picking two cards and losing one, you can pick three cards from your hand and lose two of them. So uh, you get to activate all three, which means you have much more impactful turns, but you are just burning through that deck. So um, in this play, we had three of us. And I uh, went really hard uh, with trying to get uh, the buy lots of stuff strategy and then burn stuff out with uh, losing two out of the three with my actions. 
But the problem that I had was I was burning too fast. Now you don't have to discard three when you have that option, but I kept doing it because that's fun. I wanted those big actions and I seemed to be doing really well in the mid game. But at a certain point, about three quarters of the way through the game, I ran out of gas. I, I pretty much ran out of cards. I had like three or four cards left in my deck and I realized, whoa, 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 I have to spend several turns building my deck back up again before I keep ripping it apart. And unfortunately, by the time my deck was good enough to really start competing again, the game was ended by my opponents who never really had that slowdown. Now, there are uh, many cards in the game that you can uh, take that actually have the ability to let you get more cards. So you can spend cards to get cards, which means your overall level in your deck is going to stay even. And one of my opponents also had the play three cards, lose two, but he kept getting cards that let him get more cards. So he was a lot more action efficient and he was able to keep the gas going in his engine. Now, he actually lost. Uh, the person who won um, uh, never had the extra uh, mana or the, the crystals to buy new stuff. Uh, they never had the play three cards in a turn, they did have a larger hand size overall, but they were able to leverage some of the other runestone abilities to uh, pull off the win. And honestly, I enjoyed the play and I felt like I deserved to lose. Like I, I was uh, uh, flying a little bit too close to the sun. I was playing a little bit uh, fast and loose. And uh, both of my opponents, uh, when we discussed it at the end of the game, were doing a lot better deck building than I was. Um, I was doing a lot of just picking and choosing like that looks powerful, that looks powerful, throw it into my deck, cool. Whereas both of my opponents were really trying to focus in on just a couple of colors and they did not take cards that were powerful of other colors. And what this meant was they were more likely to have all or a lot of cards of the same color in their hand so that they could discard that to do more of those powerful card buys. And that definitely helped them out. So I think uh, I also deserve to lose because I was bad at deck building <laughs> in this particular play. Uh, so once it was all over, I think the game took about 90 minutes, maybe a little bit more. Uh, all three of us enjoyed the, uh, the experience. It was certainly fun, but I think we also all felt like it was a bit long. Um, there was a, a bit of a, a flow to the game where in the beginning you would uh, desperately try to get a couple artifacts, cash those in to get a runestone, which gives you a power. Powers are good. They make you more efficient and do cool stuff. Uh, well, get another couple of artifacts, cash those in, get another runestone. But we kept doing that with very low victory point artifacts. And this game keeps going until one person hits I think it was 65 victory points. So that means each time we were getting these small, small, small amounts of points. And by about the 40 minute point, uh, nobody had cracked, I think even 20 points. So I was starting to get a little bit worried, but also at that point we had essentially built out our runestone engines. So now we switched into the second phase of the game, essentially, where we no longer really cared about getting more runestones. It was all about getting as many of these artifacts as we could before we cashed them in to be as efficient as possible. So that part of the game, it just felt a bit long, like that that latter part. It just seemed like uh, we we had our system and we were running it and we were running it and we were running it and we kept running it. And um, to me, I feel like that's pretty easy to house rule. You could just say the game ends when you're at 55 points or 50 points or 45 points if you want to have the game be a little bit more explosive. So um, if I had a copy of the game, I would very likely experiment with ending the game with a lower victory point threshold. Uh, but I don't think I'm particularly interested in uh, going out to get a copy. Uh, while it has a really cool idea with deck building. It's a very streamlined idea. It's uh, very fresh in the deck building space. Um, I just don't think I'm as excited, excited enough to like get a copy and keep pulling it off the shelf. I feel like I did a lot of what was in the game. Obviously I did it poorly, but I watched other people doing it well. And um, yeah, I guess excitement factor is the biggest uh, thing when it comes to play and do how much more I'm going to play it. Uh, we did not play it a second time at BGG Con. It did not make the cut to have another experience overall. And I think part of that was because it was a little bit long. And um, if I have the opportunity to play this one again in the future, I think it's likely that I will uh, take that opportunity because I would like to try my hand at being better at the game, but uh, I don't think I'm going to uh, actively try to push that opportunity to happen for myself. Okay, we've now reached the end of this impressions vlog and I have finally officially caught up. I have talked about all of the new games that I played over the course of November, which was 28 games, which is why you have been getting so many of these impressions vlogs flooding your subscription feed if you are one of the subscribers to this channel. So I hope you've enjoyed learning about these games as well as the other 24 games I've discussed over the last couple weeks. Uh, going, uh, Looking forward into January and February, I'll probably switch back into doing one or two of these a month based off of the number of new games that I played. Uh, honestly, at this point, I'm going to be having a copy of The Magnificent and Marco Polo 2 coming in, and I'm hoping to play those a bunch. I'm hoping to play Marco, uh, Markaibo a bunch as well. So I might be shifting shifting away from playing new games a lot and uh, pushing into just enjoying the games that I already like for the next month or so. And I'm sure I'll still work in some new games as well. So I think that's going to bring me to the end. 
As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level Patreon backers. If you too would like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos like this one, then please go to johngetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you can do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.